Very good. Welcome to um, cybersecurity and the ransomware wave. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I think we've got a very interesting panel. I'm going to introduce people just very, very quickly because their bios are in your <coughs> app. Um, from uh, my right, Rick Ferguson from Trent Micro, um, Mary M. Hussein uh, from Ernst & Young, um, Dave Palmer, Dark Trace, and um, Raj Samani, who is from McAfee. So we've got sort of all the aspects of this covered, I think, we'll be able to talk about um, the technology, about the human factors, and a little bit about the law enforcement potential for this area. So I'm going to begin just by asking a, a few broad questions. You know, I guess the biggest one is when you look at it, at least according to one estimate, in 2015, ransomware losses were in the, around $325 million. Um, right now, it looks like the estimate for 2017 is $5 billion. So, you know, if ransomware was a startup, we should do an IPO because this is a really successful business. So I guess the first question is, uh, and maybe I'll start with Rick, why all of a sudden? I mean, the technology for ransomware has been around for a while, mm -hmm. but it's really just the last two to three years that it's become big. What's, the, what's driving this? Yeah, ransomware actually has a, a very long pedigree. The first ransomware was actually delivered on a five and a quarter inch floppy disk back in 1988. Um, and it was actually <laughs> created and released by a, a medical professional um, and distributed to hospitals and clinics um, and uh, demanded a, a license fee uh, for this software that nobody had asked for. But to answer the question of, of why now, um, the primary and overriding answer is because it works, because it makes large amounts of money. Criminals do whatever makes them money. and. The focus that criminals have put on the world of ransomware recently is borne out by some of the statistics. If you look at uh, one of the things that we track is the number of unique families of ransomware that are created. And um, 2016, the last full year figures we have, was a 752% increase in unique families of ransomware out there. Obviously, every family has many, many variants. Um, why does it make so much money? It's a combination of um, it uses very effective social engineering, so there's a very strong human aspect to ransomware, sending people emails, uh, in, enticing them to click on a link or download a file. It then uses uh, even greater social engineering to get people to actually pay the ransom, um, feelings of urgency, um, bribing people by displaying unsavory images on the screen. Um, child sexual exploitation material, for example, was one um, very early example of, of ransomware. But I think most importantly, from a criminal perspective, it works financially because they get to cut out the middleman. In traditional cybercrime, let's say you make unauthorized transactions or you steal credit card details, to cash out, to get that money out of the system, you rely on a series of middlemen or money mules where you, you make the fraudulent transaction to one mule, they keep a percentage, they make another transaction, they keep a percentage, and finally you get cash or goods out of the system uh, to turn it into, into an untraceable transaction. With ransomware, you've re-established that direct link between the victim and the attacker, and you don't have to sacrifice any of your profits to people who are enabling your cash out. Tie that in with the emergence of cryptocurrencies, um, and that's kind of a perfect <coughs> form for ransomware, that's where we're at. Got it. Um, Raj, quick question for you. What should people, if, if there's one thing people can do right now when they leave the room, uh, go back to their organizations, what would it be? Is there a number one? Sure. So, so actually, um, you know, slightly controversial, but security is not that difficult. You know, basic measures can, can go a long way to protecting you. I mean, you know, for example, today we just learned of a fire and emergency medical service who have lost years' worth of data due to ransomware. And it turns out, or it appears, that they don't even have something as simple as a backup. So there are simple measures that we can take. And I think, you know, the other thing to recognize is in the event that you are hit by ransomware, there are tools that are out there that give you a third option. Because today, if you're impacted by ransomware, you, you, you effectively have two options, which is pay criminals or lose access to your data. And today there are sites like No More Ransom um, and, and other sort of repositories where they provide free toolkits for you to use to decrypt your data in the event that it occurs. But 
but fundamentally, like it's not that difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important to, to mention the existence of No More Ransom, right. uh, which is a fascinating site and has a lot of information right there. Is it up to date? How do you stay up to date with this? Well, so we, we co-founded this initiative with law enforcement. Um, there were about four partners initially. We're at 116 partners now with agencies all across the world. And when we began, we only had four tools. In other words, four families that we could mm -hmm. decrypt. We now decrypt 84 families. And every time that we work with law enforcement, we disrupt infrastructure or we, or we take down the bad guys. We extract the decryption keys and we make that available free of charge to individuals. And today, we have currently prevented about $10 million getting into the hands of criminals in just, just over 12 months. Mm -hmm. Dave, I've been, actually, there's two panels here uh, today that are talking about artificial intelligence, deep learning, that sort of thing, and its impact on business. Uh, what is the impact of that kind of machine learning, AI, in terms of security defenses? Like everything else in security, I think it will go uh, in a positive way and a negative way. Rick was talking about compelling social engineering to begin with, and the one of the things that's difficult to scale is if you're trying to personalize attacks if you want to find something out as much as you can about raj and tailor an attack towards him then you have to spend some human time doing that uh, but we are getting to machines that are very much smart enough to be able to Google Raj, find a load of things about him, find out who he converses with, uh -huh. and send a even more well-tailored attack uh, to him to try and activate ransomware or, or some other criminal business model. So there will be downsides to uh, AI or automation um, in, in cybersecurity. The positive sides all come down to what we've been trusting computers to do for a long time, which is deal with complexity and large amounts of data and uh, operate at speeds that are much faster than humans can do. So uh, I've absolutely no doubt that it's just a continuing evolution for how we write really smart software and defenses, and it will touch all, all the different parts of cybersecurity, whether it's firewalls or antivirus or traditional defenses, or whether we'll start to see emergent properties in our data stores that say, you know what, hey Dave's laptop, we're not sure that the way you're suddenly trying to access data is in line with how you should behave and therefore we're not going to listen to you for the next 20 minutes or an hour until a human being has, has green-lighted that that's okay. So hmm. I think we'll see an evolution of, of all parts, but um, it's, it's not the answer to everything. The bad guys are going to adopt it just as fast as the good guys will. A bit of an arms race. As always. Mm -hmm. That was actually one of my big concerns around AI. And I know we're drifting away from ransomware slightly, but it, it's certainly a, a way that ransomware can be deployed in the future. Um, artificial intelligence and machine learning is something that is being used in many different industries. We use it in the security industry, use it in the finance industry. Um, pretty much every vertical will make use of AI and machine learning in one way or another. Um, but what I fully expect to see in terms of the adversary is that um, you know, one of the, I can see a gentleman in uniform right in front of me, one of the things that we talk about um, in scary news stories a lot at the moment is autonomous weaponry. People worry about, you know, a weapon that you can let it go, it can select its own targets and engage by itself with no human interaction. Um, there's absolutely no reason not to think that we won't have autonomous cyber weaponry and that it will be deployed by adversaries. So intelligent, uh, artificially intelligent, um, autonomous bots that are capable of looking for and exploiting vulnerabilities and deploying payloads with little to no human interaction. And that's really the next mm -hmm. iteration of how malicious payloads get deployed, and it's not far away. Yeah, I think it's worth pointing out that although our focus here is ransomware, this is basically a cybersecurity issue, much uh, writ, writ large. Um, Although one, one element here is the human engineering, the social engineering element. And Miriam, I know that you spend a lot of time looking at how organizations deal with, uh, with illegalities in their process. Yeah. What, what can we do and what are the problems that come from the human side? Yeah. So my, my perspective on this is having spent the past 20 years of my professional life investigating fraud and corruption around the world. And I see cybercrime just as a mutation of that. It's, it's simply a crime. Uh, 
Um, and when you've got organizations at a scale, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees, millions of transactions and interactions every day, it is inevitable that with the best preventative systems around the world, something is going to get through. And then it's a race against time once someone's got through to the organization catching up and dealing with it. My observation and perspective is often the greatest harm is done not simply by the attack itself, but by how the organization chooses to respond to it, or is prepared to respond to it. And I'll give you some real basics. Um, so you will have, generally speaking, organizations either have or have access to individuals who've got the technical expertise to start, you know, if you like, there's a hole in the ship, start working out how big is the hole, you know, how much water is coming in, let's try and fix that. But in parallel, there has to be leadership to keep the, keep the ship steady and, and, and afloat. So what does that mean? Practically, um, I was doing a fraud investigation for an organization that was at the same time hit by a cyber attack. So let me give you some of the scenarios. Um, we talk a lot about um, GDPR and the requirement to notify if personal data has been breached. Well, in that world, you've got 72, 72 hours notice. What if you're a listed organization uh, subject to, uh, to uh, insider, insider trading regulations, which require you to disclose publicly if there is a, if there is a piece of information that affects your share price? And there was a survey earlier on this year that showed when there's a cyber attack, there was an, within a week, there was an average of about 1.8% effect on the share price, potentially up to 15%. When do you disclose? What do you disclose? Imagine you're, um, you're in a situation where you've got banking covenants. Your systems are down. You've been subject to an attack. You can't issue your bills. You're not going to get a cash in in time. You might be, you might be in breach of your covenants in the, in the short to medium term. What do you do? How do you communicate? Uh, I'll give you one other example. Um, the news has hit the press that you've had this attack. Your customers are afraid to deal with you. They're afraid to, to communicate with you. You actually know that you probably contained it, but they're still afraid to communicate with you. What do you do? They're asking, they're saying, well, we'll we, want, we would like some legal indemnities against any losses if we do communicate with you and we suffer any losses. Do you give the indemnity? What does that mean about your financial statements, are your auditors going to need extra liabilities to be recognized on that? So it was the day-to-day -day of A, giving the professionals the time and space, because they're going to be inundated as well, to deal with the problem at the same time as running the business. And when that second bit, when the organization is not prepared for that second bit, you might fix the first and still have damage far, far beyond the original attack itself. So I think that would that kind of that's my overall observation. I'll just make one other observation. This is at, similar to all other threats. There is no answer because the threat's going to be evolving. You, you mentioned one aspect of it. But, you know, I deal with I know, bribery, corruption, rogue traders. Um, human beings are endlessly ingenious, and they do in endlessly wonderful things, but they also have the capacity to think through and around any systems that you might put, put together. So that resilience and flexibility is important because there is not going to be one answer. Now, you mentioned GDPR, which is nominally a great thing, and it's going to force people to disclose, and it's going to force uh, enterprises to pay more attention to protecting uh, personally identifiable information, and that's all to the good. But like you say, humans are um, infinitely ingenious when it comes to devising uh, new ways to profit from uh, things like regulation and legislation. And I think one of the very short-term things that we'll see around GDPR is, is an evolution around extortion, um, where... Um, Criminal organizations will attack an organization, they will steal a volume of data, large or small, um, and then they will present proof of that theft to the victim organization and say, well, you know, if you have to notify under GDPR, that's going to cost you 20 million euros or 4% of your annual turnover, whichever is bigger, but you only have to pay us 200,000 to keep quiet and you can have your data back. Um, and if that sounds infeasible to you, you've only got to look at what happened to Uber and how willing, even in the absence of GDPR, Uber were to pay 100,000 US dollars to nominally keep their, their attackers quiet. In a world where GDPR is going to be charging you, you know, those fines of 4% or more, um, extortion of that nature is not out of the question. So we could move from the ransomware scenario more to a traditional kind of extortion scenario. Hmm. Um, Hostageware. <laughs> I mean, just to add to this point, really, you know, there's a misconception that we're here talking about computers, but the reality is, is we're not. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you want to look at the example, I mean, WannaCry is a great, is a great case in point. NHS England confirmed that 6,312 people didn't get their medical procedures because of a computer worm. 
And I think that's one of the challenges that we face. And you know, we've seen this just uh, just a few days back with the sharing of passwords just across the bridge, <laughs> where there's a misconception that this is an IT-related issue, and yet. The impact of ransomware impacts organizations' ability to be able to function. You know, in the medical space, it's their inability to be able to serve patients. In, you know, in the private sector space, we saw because of you know, the NotPetya example, you know, revenues were impacted, significantly actually, significantly impacted. And that impacts growth. And you know, we're living in a scenario in, in which we're trying to attract business into the UK. You know, we're trying to make the UK the safest place to do business. And you know, if these things occur, if business is being held hostage, then it's going to impact the economy, it's going to impact growth. And I think that's more of the telling issue that we need to have because what's clearly evident here is, is that people still see this as a computer problem. They still see this as a, oh, it's my password. Well, what's, you know, what's the harm? It couldn't happen to me. And, and I think that's where we failed as a society and certainly as an industry is we've used these magic words like sophisticated or advanced or APTs or even words like ransomware, which gives people the kind of license to think, oh, that's an IT problem. I don't have to worry about that. Well, now, it, it's interesting, the whole question of employee training and behavior. You know, if there was any other kind of behavior that uh, an employee could, could take part in, that would create millions or hundreds of millions of dollars of loss, uh, we would have all kinds of constraints in place. They'd be fired immediately, They'd, but it doesn't seem to be the case for good, uh, sensible IT habits. What's the, I the solution to I that? I think the implication for that is, I mean, if I'm an employee, of all the things I have to worry about in a day, how much am I going to care about this? And I would also put to you the scenario, even as a member of the public, how much we, we feel that our people should really care about this because we're immersed in this. Let me give you this Uber scenario. Okay, the Uber's data has been stolen. Why do I care? I mean, if they want, if people wanted access to my, all my journeys, why do I care? They've got access to my credit card details. Well, you know, if I suffer a loss, it's a bank's problem. Why should I care? I think the, the parallel with this is uh, bribery. You know, 10, 15 years ago, it certainly wasn't something that was very high on a boardroom agenda. And, you know, for global organizations, it's certainly a risk. And organizations moved from, right, what do we do once it became an issue because there was massive regulatory action and reputational damage, um, how some organizations reacted was build massive compliance departments with rules and regulations that were then rolled out globally. And then, then it's your point. Then it was seen as, okay, maybe it's a risk, but it's not my risk and I don't care and compliance is dealing with it anyway. And I'd add to that where the rules were rolled out globally without really thinking about the cultural context, the local context of the people receiving them, they could in fact have a counterproductive uh, response. And I'll give you an example of that. If you work and live in a society, in a context where um, you are, you are, there's no trust between you and authorities, you don't interpret rules as being uh, either good for you or even neutral, but maybe a bit annoying. But the first reaction is they're malign. This is somehow designed to, to um, take something away from me and benefit someone else. So the, the kind of the pendulum of, in the case of bribery, massive compliance and rules and regulations rolled out, of course you have to have policies, uh, kind of swung back and there was a recognition that it's a business problem, to your point. Business needs to be part of recognizing why this matters and people need to care. But I think over and above that, it's, it, it, we need to find a way to make individuals realize the impact yeah, absolutely. of mm. cyber and security yeah. on their every diet. Not calling it cyber would be a good start, for <laughs> yeah. example. Um, but you know, it's countless times you know, sit in the back of a taxi, taxi driver says, what do you do for a living? You tell the driver, and the driver says, oh, I've got nothing to worry about. I've got no money anyway. I don't care if anyone breaches mm, my exactly. account. And that's kind of the, the attitude. And then the same thing, Raj mentioned passwords in the House of Commons, which <laughs> MPs have been tweeting about yesterday ridiculously, um, saying that they freely share their password with everybody who works in their office, and they don't see a problem with that um, because uh, in the case of Nadine Doris, who was the first one to, to make this pronouncement on Twitter, um, she's not part of the government, she's a backbench MP, so the only stuff on her computer is emails from her constituents and there's nothing to worry about there. Um, it's not actually only about, and, and this is the, the blink of view of, well, you know, I've got nothing valuable so it doesn't matter. It's not actually about what you have, um, it's, it's also about who you know and what you have access to, uh, whether that's 
personally among friends and family or whether that's professionally, if I can um, compromise an MP's email account, then of course I can use that to send trusted communications to other people within that person's circle. And in the case of an MP, that's pretty risky. Nadine Doris could send uh, an email to Theresa May, uh, and as long as I've got control of Nadine Doris's real email account, I can send an email from her, make it look as legitimate as you like, stick a malicious link in there and get Teresa to click on it, and I've got the Prime Minister's email account. That's kind of different. So we've got to work out how we can make people realize the potential consequences of their own failings in security and but the fact no that it has real world consequences. But there are no consequences today. And I think, you know, we've said on the panel today that if my credit card is cloned, the bank will refund mm -hmm. me money. <laughs> if you know, like, regardless of what happens, there's no penalty for bad behavior. And until that changes, then we're going to continue to see bad behavior. And equally, it's almost impossible for us to be able to say, my card was cloned because, you know, I went on this dodgy website, for example. And so, like, the ability to be able to tie um, an incident, it, it's becoming very, diff you know, almost impossible to do. And so, like, the reason we have bad behavior is because you're not punished if there's bad behavior. Even when I it makes agree, the news. But, uh, <laughs> go ahead. I think there is a flip side, though, bringing back to straight to your original point that in the specific case of ransomware, if, I open, if I'm a receptionist and I've opened an email because it's my job to open email and the company gets ransomware and doesn't have a backup, I don't want to get punished because the company is no longer operating. The CIO should be having a conversation with the board and say, this is how underfunded we were in IT. We haven't taken up a backup in three years. <coughs> strategic impact on the organization needs to be owned at the strategic level because even if we suddenly fixed all the email training overnight, the extortionists would find a different way of socially engineering our businesses. No, but that's okay. You know, if we can raise the, the, the walls just even a couple of inches, we have to make it more difficult for them. I mean, you know, one of the things we did with No More Ransom was we said, well, we have to have an initiative where we go after the criminals and we impact their return on investment. Yeah. You know, we have to make this more difficult. I mean, the fact that every person in this room knows that my 12-year-old daughter can run a ransomware campaign. <laughs> like, and we all know this. We all know that you know, children can go on the dark web, by, not even on the dark web, go on the surface web, buy stolen credit cards, hire a hitman, do whatever they need to do. So, you know, and I think back to your first question, Michael, why is this growing? It's because it's so simple to do, and it's so simple to be a cyber criminal. So next time you could ask for more pocket money, it's something you want to seriously consider. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask, well. <laughs> we know there are certain, uh, my impression overall is that we don't so much see brilliant hackers as very bad security protocols or underfunded or if I do everything right, uh, if I have real-time backups somewhere that's air-gapped, that's off my system, if I have patched my operating systems with absolutely everything the first day that they're out, um, if I've really trained my employees well, am I immune no. to ransomware? No, absolutely not. You're not immune to cybercrime at all. I mean, one of the most successful um, online criminal attacks is phishing, which doesn't rely on any vulnerability, any malicious software, anything at all. It just relies on the ability to set up a clone website that looks like something that you trust and need to visit. I reported one to Amex just yesterday, which was an absolute carbon copy of the American Express login, and that's quite simple. And not only that, but it can be done on any platform. It doesn't rely on you using your laptop, your desktop PC, your tablet, your mobile device. You can enter your credentials in a bogus website on any platform. <laughs> um, and one of the biggest crimes um, in terms of making money at the moment out there is something called business email compromise. Uh, business email compromise is very similar to the scenario I just kind of outlined with the Theresa May email account. Compromise an email account belonging to a, s a senior individual within an organization. Monitor the conversation for a period of time until you get the tone of voice right till you've got an organizational map of who works in which department, and then initiate an email exchange, usually with a bogus invoice attached, uh, with somebody senior in the finance department, put on some social engineering pressure that says, you know, hey, it's Friday afternoon, I'm about to get on a plane, there's this really important invoice, it's got to be paid by the end of the week, otherwise we're going to face severe financial consequences, make sure you get it paid right now. It's a real email that really comes from the real CEO's real inbox that goes to the real director of finance and relies on no malware, no vulnerabilities, um, and it's made um, 
in the three years to 2016, it's made five billion US dollars of losses. And we, we, saw, we saw a version of that which was very successful and what they would do is they would wait until the finance director, for example, was on holiday and they would go to the second in command who wouldn't normally, for example, have communications with the CEO and suddenly there's an email from CEO saying, we have a very um, commercially sensitive deal going through, I am trusting you, you're part of a small group of people who are being trusted, um, to be part of this and transfer the money. And you know, the people kind of people respond to that and react to that. And, and to your point about kind of the training, actually, what is it that works? Is that you can't have an endless, there's like a million different things people could do if you see this, beware of this. There's something about developing a more skeptical mindset. Because we think that we are sort of, we're very bad at lying and we're good at spotting it. In fact, it's the other way around. You know, the, the reason our societies have developed is because we rely on each other and we trust each other. And our minds are sort of, we're wired to make sense of things rather than see the things that don't quite fit together. So that kind of uh, training, there's, there's a part in that which is apart from the prescriptive look out for these things, encouraging people to have a bit more of a skeptical mindset. And that can be around particular business transactions where we have particular types of frauds or it can be around cyber security. And one of the things that, that I've been talking about a lot recently in the context of training mm -hmm. is what I call human sandboxing. So in, in cyber security terms, sandboxing is a technology where you take an unknown potentially malicious file and you let it execute in a safe environment so you can see what it does. We call that a sandbox. Um, and my argument is that we need to start sandboxing humans, allowing them to mess up <laughs> in a controlled environment where they can see the consequences of their actions and realize actually that they're not perfect, that they're not uh, incorruptible, that they're not unfoolable. Um, so we, we developed a bunch of um, online uh, video resources where when I was a kid I used to read these books called Choose Your Own Adventure books. You know, you would read a paragraph and it would say, if you go east, go to page 237, if you go west, go to page 4. And every time you read the book you get a different story. So we've done that with video where you get to play the person responsible for security, for example, in an organization. You watch the first part of the story, you make a decision, and the story continues depending on the decisions that you've made. Um, and it's an invaluable training tool, um, and I'm not selling it to you because it's just on the web and you can go and just use it. Um, but it, it allows people to realize that they can mess up, that they're not perfect. They don't have the capability to make all the right decisions all the time. Yeah, but, but if we think we can train people out of subconscious levers, I think that's, I think that's a fallacy. You know, I, I mean, there's a, the psychologist Caldini says there are six levers that you can use to influence people. Um, and, and actually, authority is, is clearly one of them. But I think the, the other challenge that we have to recognize is, okay, look, if we accept that people are going to fall for these tricks, because, like you said, we're hardwired to, to potentially, you know, take things, that, that, you know, take things for granted, then we have to create a scenario in which people feel comfortable to be able to raise their hands Absolutely. when they make a mistake. And, and, you know, we've kind of got this binary approach where there's trial by Twitter, right? Somebody says something and all of a sudden their reputation's in tatters. So maybe the opportunity would be to be able to say, look, if you do make a mistake, okay, it's okay to put your hand up and tell people that, okay, you know, there's been an issue and then perhaps we can try to reduce the impact. But people are so scared to put their hands up because they, they fear for their jobs. And, you know, we've kind of created this environment of fear within organizations where people move from the subconscious to the conscious. So, for example, you know, criminals might say, okay, look, now that you've given me this data, give it to me again. And if you refuse to, I'm going to tell your employers that you gave me the data last week. So, there has to be a better way than simply just saying, if you click on an email, you're fired. It's about security culture, because the flip side of that as well is, um, that's important, what Raj just said is very important, that the ability to raise your hand and say, hey, I messed up, and, and not fear for your job. But equally, empowerment within a, a business or within any organization, um, everybody should be empowered with the ability to say no if somebody within that organization is going outside the established process, even if it's your CEO that's mailing you, or nominally your CEO that's mailing you and saying, here's a really important invoice, get it paid now. If you've got a dual sign-off process on invoice payments or to add a new account number or to change an account number on a payee account needs verification, which it damn well should, um, even if it's your CEO pressuring you into doing that, you should be fully empowered and feel totally within your rights to say no, this is the process, I understand you're the CEO, this is the process, and actually the process is more important than you. But you've got to create that culture 
within an organization. That's and that's tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had the opposite of that yesterday. I received an email telling me that there was an invoice for $165,000. And we put it into a sandbox. We opened it up. And honestly, I was praying to God it was a phishing email, but it turned out to be real. <laughs> 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 and I said no, by the way, as well. <laughs> I was empowered. <laughs> now, when we, we look at the future of uh, deep learning, of machine intelligence, is there a combination of technology and human factors here? In other words, the ability to look at every incoming email and determine whether it might be phishing. Uh, determine whether it's uh, an email from the CEO that's outside of the normal bounds of protocol, and uh, somehow attach a warning to that email. Is there, you know, so that then the employee at least is reminded that they need to think about this twice. Is there a... a so that technology exists already. I mean, mm -hmm. anti-spam, anti-phishing, anti-malware, yeah. behavioral analysis, machine learning, yeah. um, virtual patching, uh, all of this stuff exists right now, but... <laughs> I guess what you're saying is, will, will we see a world where there's no more cybercrime? Um, and yes, we will, absolutely, as soon as we have a world where there's no more crime. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but this is it's a one game way of we're going with that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, this is a game of cat and mouse, right? And we've said this many times before. But like, you know, in, in two, I'll give you an example. So in 2015, we published a piece of research against a ra ransomware variant by the name of CryptoWall, mm -hmm. version 3. That made $325 million. And I, I remember we published on the Wednesday, and we were quite happy with ourselves. We said this is a great piece of research. And, and I left Las Vegas, got into London. And by the time I got into London, we'd seen the next iteration of CryptoWall, version 4. And actually, all of the, 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 the holes that we saw previously had been, had been covered. And so... We, we have to recognize that we're dealing with an adversary that is resourced, that, that can hire some of the world's best talent. And so this, this is a continual game of innovation. But th the challenge that we face is, is that we're just making it far too simple. You know, we, we want them to have to reinvest and hire the best people and try to find ways around the technologies. But quite frankly, when you have... I mean, there was an organization just recently that were tweeting photos of their computers, and at the bottom, they actually had their password. I think it was <laughs> NBC, and the password was NBC, and it was out there for the whole world to see. So, look, I, I realize that these are great buzzwords, machine learning, AI, deep learning, and so forth, but the reality is, is that people can just email you and ask for the information, and, they, and your employees give it. And so, let's just make it slightly more difficult for them and make them work for the money. Yeah, we, we were attacked at Trend Micro in exactly that way over the telephone. Nothing to do with malware, nothing to do with yeah. exploits, vulnerabilities. Um, somebody phoned Trend Micro pretending to be me, actually, um, probably because they'd seen my name externally associated with the company. Uh, and they spoke to a person working in uh, the technical support department in India. They said, hey, yeah, it's Rick Ferguson. I'm in, uh, I'm in uh, Mumbai right now. I'm flying to Delhi and then on to Tokyo because I've got, I've got a, a really big meeting with uh, all of the Japanese office because we're HQ'd in Tokyo. Um, but I have a problem with Active Directory right now and I can't get into my email account. Um, and I need all the details of all the Trend Micro Japan employees, but you can't send it to my corporate email address uh, because I can't get into that because I have password issues. So I'm going to give you this external email address. Can you extract all of that from the database and send it out to this external address? <laughs> Luckily, we had that culture in place where there is a process, there are a set of verification questions, and if you don't pass, it doesn't matter who you are, you don't get the response you're looking for. Uh, but if we hadn't have had that process in place, I have absolutely no doubt that that information would have left the company and that would have been a serious breach of PII of mm. thousands of people because we have a lot of employees in the Tokyo office. But th these attacks don't rely on technology and the ones that do, um, the technology they rely on, if we come up with you know, you know, <coughs> bigger and better guns, um, then of course the criminals will invest in overcoming that. Machine learning is something which has been in the security headlines for the past couple of years as you know, the new savior technology. Well, we already see ransomware, uh, which is um, investing in anti-machine you know, machine learning evasion technologies. That already exists. So. Here's, here's a question. If there was, you know, <clears throat> most risks, uh, let's look at it from a corporate point of view, most risks that involve, you know, potentially large financial losses uh, are insured, right? Um, where is the insurance? 
world in this. I know that there is increasing talk about the fact that there will be, uh, there is cyber insurance already, but mm -hmm. the risk is so hard to define, it's very difficult to set premiums, as I understand it. But I know in the United States, there is interest in the insurance industry in creating some sort of more uh, regularized kind of cyber insurance. And I would think boards of directors would be sort of interested in the potential for that. Yeah. Where's the insurance industry in this? So, so I've said in the past, I think cyber insurance today is a sham. And, and I kind of still stand by that. Yeah. And, and, and it's not because, actually, for a number of reasons. I think it's very difficult because in the physical world, things are very binary. You know, I have my car. Right, that is the asset. I can no longer access that car. Was that car, you know, did that car have an alarm? You know, all of these questions that you can ask, like on the phone, you can phone, phone an insurance agent up and you can answer questions, yes and no, and they'll be able to determine the risk. But in, in, the, in the digital world, I think it's very difficult, aside from maybe availability. You know, in the world of availability, I think cyber insurance is absolutely viable. But there are so many get out clauses. Like for example, okay, you know, your data was stolen. How do you know it was stolen? Okay, how did they get in? Well, okay, did you have the appropriate measures in place? And, and to be able to determine whether the appropriate measures are in place, I think principle seven of the DPA would do that. It's subjective and it's probably gonna likely, likely require a two week audit or a three week audit or a four week audit. And so I think that we don't have like metrics in place to be able to determine the level of security that's deployed. It's, it's such a subjective environment. And so it's such a nascent and immature industry. For availability, it's very simple. I can no longer access my assets. Okay, we can, we can verify that. How long were you with, without access to those assets? Very simple to do. But around confidentiality and certainly integrity, I, I think it's way too immature. And I think it's quite dangerous, actually. If I'm going to be talking about people, you know, if employees care about this, I want to care even less. You know, my list of things is already pretty low down anyway. And even, even if something happens, my organization is insured. You know, there, there is something. I mean, I think we were talking earlier before the panel around if you grew up in an era where um, seat belts were compulsory, you sort of grow up with it that this is the right thing to do. Just do it. Don't think about it so much. So this will give another reason that, you know, this is not just something you do. Be aware. Be skeptical. Be protective. It's, it's something which is probably someone else's problem, either IT, someone else. And then even if it happens, it's insured. Um, I think from and it's behavior. funny also because some, some you know, seatbelts is great because it just occurs to me while we're sitting here. Um, new technologies that you bring to bear always bring with them new risks as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, when I was uh, 11 years old, seatbelts still weren't a legal requirement here. And we went on holiday with my parents to Sweden. And my dad's driving the car. He never used to wear a seatbelt. Uh, but in Sweden, you had to at the time. So my mum's kind of elbowing him and nudging us, like, get your seatbelt on. Um, so as he's turned to get his seatbelt and trying to put it on, he's ended up putting the car in a ditch because he wasn't paying attention to the road <laughs> ahead of him and he was reaching for the seatbelt. True story. Um, and you've got to bear that in mind when it comes to security as well. The more code that you introduce to environment, the more product, the more uh, security even, it will bring its own vulnerabilities and its own concerns that you need to address. So when do you stop doing that layering? Um, and, and the thing with security software, over and above everything else, is that it operates with, usually, extremely high levels of privilege. So if your security software can be misused or compromised, or if it has weaknesses, that should be a very real area for concern. And I think we're seeing some of that in the media at the moment. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, probably the other thing to add here is we've talked, talked a lot about ransomware, but actually about six months ago, we began to see the emergence of what we would call pseudo-ransomware, where... You know, like, like everybody here is sitting here listening to a discussion about ransomware and believe ransomware is about holding data hostage and making money. But actually, it's being used now as a diversionary tactic. So, for example, in, um, in the Bank of Taiwan, we recently investigated, they actually used ransomware to get the IT departments to focus in on the encrypted data while they were stealing tens of millions of dollars out of the back door. Um, you know, WannaCry, you could argue, wasn't ransomware. It was used for something else. Not Petty, it was used to, to destroy systems. And so the reality now is, is that criminals have this kind of smorgasbord of options that they can use to go out and target an organization. So is, is it a DDoS attack meant to impact availability? Or actually, is it something there to bring your site down? And we've seen criminals being available for hire to literally go out and disrupt competitors. And I think that's a really key point here, which is, you know, this 
this word cyber, I guess, but you know, we're seeing these, these attack vectors being used, but actually the, you know, what's being used is, is really nothing more than a distraction. Mm -hmm. Dave, I was looking at some, uh, I think you spoke at a security conference here in London a few weeks ago, and, and you had a quote that was interesting, which was, battling our own complexity is a key. Well, I think this is building on Rick's point here, really. The, you look at the digital estate of any business now, and it's absolutely exploding in complexity all the time. How many pieces of smart te technology are even in this room that are wireless, wirelessly connected? Or how powerful are all the chips in that massive TV that's in front of us or on the, the side? We make completely unconscious decisions about introducing technology into our businesses now. And when you mm. see video conferencing units in boardrooms getting hacked, when you see smart TVs with microphones or, or cameras getting hacked, they aren't the sort of thing that your security team or your CIO is generally thinking about, but they do present new ways of listening to conversations or accessing secrets, and they're absolutely fascinating. And when you go and talk to organizations and say, who's allowed to buy technology? And you find the office manager can buy as many smart TVs in for the meeting rooms as he or she wants, and maybe all your video conferencing units and smart uh, iPads for the meeting rooms aren't even run by your company. They're run by the services organization that your business employs. They may be on your networks, they may be on someone else's networks, but they're definitely party to every conversation that you're having in a meeting room environment or an open office environment as well. And no doubt, as we get better and better at hardening our Windows 10 laptops and our iPhones, etc., that the the criminals, to Raj's point earlier, will just move to where it's most convenient to attack next. And if I'm interested in knowing uh, what M&A discussions are going on in a law firm um, with their, their client firms, you know, I probably do, I'm, I'm less interested in grinding through the emails. I'd rather just um, have some sort of ability to find out where the head of the M&A practice is and listen to their conversations. Yeah. You'd even watch it on television. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. Um, which, of course, leads to sort of the next. Uh, we hear a lot of talk now about the Internet of Things as the next frontier in cybersecurity problems. The, the notion that a factory floor can be hijacked. Um, is this something that's on the horizon? Is it something that your it's something customers that's are already. worried about? I mean, um, an organization called ZDI, Zero Day Initiative, uh, is like a, it's a global network of security researchers that go off and they're independent, they do their own thing, do their own research, then they sell their research to ZDI, uh, which is usually a vulnerability, and ZDI will work with the affected um, vendor to make sure the vulnerability gets patched. And we've seen a massive increase in terms of vulnerabilities being found and, and sold to ZDI uh, in SCADA, in ICS, Industrial Control Systems, um, and in connected devices and IoT things. So um, we did a live demo on stage recently where we had, uh, so we had a door with a, a key card lock on the door. We had a security camera above the door and we had a robot behind the door. Um, so the first thing we did was use a vulnerability in the um, CCTV management system to inject video footage uh, onto the, the the, the monitor that the security guard would be looking at. Um, so while the camera is nominally still working, it's not sending live data back to the, the display, it's sending this looped. Uh, we were in a conference room, so we'd taken footage of the empty conference room the day before, and suddenly the audience that could see themselves just disappeared and they could see this empty room, and it was just a loop. Mm. So nothing's happening, even if you're jumping up and down in front of the camera. Uh, and then we used another exploit against a vulnerability to unlock, to remotely unlock the door instead of using a key card. And then we used a second vulnerability in the same system to lock the administrator out and make it look like like all the doors were still locked. So he couldn't, he couldn't see what was going on from his management platform. And then we used uh, an exploit on a USB stick. Now we're in the factory, there's no cameras, the doors are all open, nobody can relock them again. We have a USB stick with another exploit on it, walk up to the industrial robot, plug in the USB, and change the tolerances on this manufacturing robot by a couple of millimeters, and then walk out again. No one knows what you've done, but you've massively impacted their ability to, to function, um, and this is, this is not tomorrow, this is not next week, this is absolutely already real and already possible. Goodness. Well, on that note, which sounds a little like the, the next episode of Black Mirror, um, <laughs> uh, 
let me turn it over to the audience for some questions if we're not entirely overwhelmed at this point. Do we have any questions or comments? Yes. Sorry, I have a question on the... Uh, you talked uh, we need a microphone down here. Thank here you. Here it comes. Uh, you've all talked a lot about the criminals, the people doing those kinds of crimes. Is there a specific profile uh, of, the, of the kind of people out there that are doing that? Yeah, so, mm. so I mean, I think that's a great question because, you know, historically we kind of categorized the adversary as, you know, either being a lone wolf, a hacktivist, a nation state, or a cyber criminal. And, and the reality is, is that I think that's like five years ago thinking. I mean, it's an incredibly fluid marketplace. Um, you know, two years ago, the head of Europol said there are 100 cyber criminal kingpins, and they have more cyber offensive capability than most nation states. And so what we're seeing now is the emergence of what we would call cybercrime or the cybercrime economy, in which individual coders are available for hire, and they can go out and they can you know, whether it's a criminal campaign or whether it's a nation state campaign, they're available to do whatever needs to be done. And so we, we kind of have to move away from this notion to say, oh, well, that's a nation state. And if it's a nation state, they will use zero days and they are the most sophisticated. Actually, that's, that's kind of five years ago thinking. And, I, and I'll give you a great case in point. Um, three, we three weeks ago, we uncovered a campaign being run by Fancy Bear, who are referred to be a uh, group backed by a nation state. And the misconception is that this group used nothing but zero days. But in fact, they used a vulnerability that was published by the security community. And so they were literally just reading our blogs. And then they used, they, used, uh, w they used this vulnerability in Microsoft products and did a campaign all across Europe, actually specifically targeting um, public sector, US federal public sector. So the reality is, is anybody potentially has the access to do this. And if they don't have the capability, they can just go and hire somebody. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are certainly areas, I guess, that you could say are spiritual homes of different kinds of badness. Um, like, weirdly, uh, Brazil is the spiritual home of banking malware. That's kind of where that all started. <laughs> hmm. um, uh, China is super strong on mobile malware. That's an area of focus there, because in China, uh, the Google Play Store is not available, so third-party app stores are the norm. So distributing mobile malware is a much more simple proposition in China than it is in, in many other places. Uh, and obviously the, the uh, traditional organized online crime uh, is related to Russia and Ukraine spiritually. But like Raj says, it's a global economy um, and it's also now a very niche economy. So there are, there are criminals whose sole business model is serving other criminals and actually nothing to do with the, um, the initiation of committing a crime. They, there are you know, cybercrime as a service operations where your, your commercial offering, if you like, is that uh, you'll say to all the other criminals out there, hey, if you created a bad file, uh, you give it to me, pay me a subscription, and I'll keep scanning that file against all of the security providers, yeah. and I'll just let you know when it gets detected. It's I've still a criminal activity, um, but you're only servicing other criminals. You're not actually attacking nominally anybody. So it's a, it's a very widespread and very mature and very every niche is filled in this niche economy. You know, my personal favorite, sorry, my personal no. favorite on that cyber crime economy, um, we actually found a service which will go out and send 30 million emails a month. And they actually have a live chat customer service window. Yeah. If, you, <laughs> if you don't know how to do cybercrime, they will do that for you. And some ransomware developers have their own help desks. And so... It's an economy. <laughs> yeah, if you don't know how to get Bitcoin, yeah. So yeah. some ransomware has like an interactive chat window that will talk you through how to buy Bitcoin, how to get a wallet, and then how to send your Bitcoin to the criminals. It's like <laughs> I'll That's pick it. that up just, just, oh, go ahead. just briefly from, from another perspective. So we often get asked, um, so especially when we're doing investigations around rogue traders, you know, employees that have brought down entire organizations, how do we profile for this? So it's a slightly different lens on this. Perhaps an employee that might be tempted into um, cooperating with a criminal from outside. And we talk about the, kind of the fraud triangle of if you have the opportunity, if you have the incentive. And critically, if you can convince yourself, say as an employee sitting there, that by doing this you're not really a bad guy, Guy, then that brings the, the conditions together to, um, for you to be vulnerable to, for example, be turned by a criminal from outside. And what I mean by that justification is, if there's a culture, for example, where people feel badly treated, badly paid, you know, they're not really get what's, you know, they're more vulnerable to being, to being turned, and that's as relevant to cybercrime as other types of crime. Yeah. Uh, question in the back, yes. 
Rupert Feltz, thank you. Asimov's Xerox law of robotics, a robot may not harm humanity. How close are military drones to breaking that? Hmm. Well. Not even the zero law, actually. A robot may not harm a human, which was the first law of robotics. Um, th that's already a technical possibility. That's why there's a, a petition in front of the United Nations signed by, I think, 119 leading scientists and academics, led by Elon Musk, actually, uh, calling for a United Nations ban on autonomous weaponry. I mean, that's a robot mm -hmm. harming a human, let alone humanity. Uh, it's banned in the UK now, as far as I understand it. The UK government has said, we're not going to do that, we're never going to do that, it's illegal to do that. But to ban it in one country is pretty much meaningless. So, yeah, that's a UN, um, a UN activity that really needs to be followed through on. And I believe there's a video that they've produced of what a potential assassin uh, drone that's autonomous could be like. It's a quite terrifying mm. video. But the problem with that video is it's quite futuristic and it talks about explosive micro yes. drones that assassinate individual people by recognizing their face. The reality is if you can access a robot that can steer things and pull a trigger, I can write you a program in three days that will target the sort of people you don't want to exist anymore. So if you can drive down the streets of London and say, I don't like people with blue scarves, I will give you the software in three days that could, that could target people wearing blue scarves or fluffy hats or whatever it is, you know, two men holding hands. Whatever your personal horrendous beliefs are, we are easily at the point where you can have a machine that targets those sorts of people. So the, I am deeply concerned about autonomous kill decision robots and what we have is a world where in cyber crime we fail to prosecute the overwhelming majority of international criminals we have no global levers for tracking them down and, and making a case for them there's no suggestion that the world is getting better at pursuing these mega crimes look at the point where we've only just brought some of the Balkan conflicts to the uh, to the war crime court and yet we are a set of free YouTube or Coursera training videos away from people to write these things themselves. Now I have no elite special skills that you couldn't spend 12 months on YouTube and produce exactly the same software. This has become very accessible for all sorts of people. I'll tell you what concerns me, which ties, ties this point to your point about IoT earlier on. Um, you think about autonomous weaponry and connected devices, uh, just think about autonomous vehicles. What's a terrorist weapon of choice at the moment? It's cars and trucks, right? That's, that's an, a nice, easy to acquire, easy to use, devastating weapon. We've seen it in multiple different countries. We're talking about autonomous vehicles becoming reality. They're trying to accelerate, pardon the pun, they're trying to accelerate that on, on UK roads, certainly, and I know it's happening globally too. Um, we spoke about where there's code, where, the, where there's code, there's a vulnerability. Um, there are actually very few car manufacturers in the world, in, in, in real terms. There are very few organizations making cars. Um, so let's say you have a fleet of autonomous vehicles on the road, uh, all with the same vulnerability, all which would allow remote access and remote control of the vehicle. We've seen it happen with a hack on Jeep already, so it's not out of the realms of possibility. What are you handing to terrorists at that point? If you have a global network of connected autonomous vehicles that can be compromised and remotely controlled. And then they have all the sensors on board that are there to recognize people, push chairs, bicycles, street signs. Maybe you can use your fleet of autonomous weaponry remotely to uh, take out law enforcement first because you can recognize the hats and the uniforms and then you start going after the civilians after that or looking at other kinds of important infrastructure. Maybe you knock out a couple of fire hydrants so the area is covered in water, more confusion, start killing more people. This is why IoT and IoT security is a massive, massive deal. And I think we do kind of get caught up in looking at the military aspect, autonomous weapons, and aren't they scary? But actually the much more scary aspect for everyday life is mm. what's the possibility for um, terrorist activity and not actually military activity. Very few of us are impacted, fortunately, by military activity in this part of the world. Can I try not to scare everybody, perhaps, just for a second? Um, I know we've got that would be a good turn, yes. So, so I, don't how, I don't know how I'm going to do that in five minutes, but <laughs> look, you know, we, we have to differentiate between vulnerabilities and exploits. Right, there are, there are a multitude of vulnerabilities. I mean, you know, a few weeks back we published our research, which was published by DHS, on the use of 2G. We can use 2G to gain access to telematics control units in many of the cars that you drive today. 
And, you know, just recently there was MedSec who published research on vulnerabilities against uh, cardiac equipment or, for example, or against insulin pumps. We know that these vulnerabilities exist, but actually there is a there is a difference between what's actually being used and exploited in the wild. In other words, yes, we know that you know, the Jeep was compromised and we know that there are vulnerabilities with that, but to date there's been no known examples where that vulnerability has been exploited in the wild. So, look, I, I, I realise that it's quite a scary world out there and we realise that there are a multitude of vulnerabilities, but the reality is, is that criminals are making so much money by just sending yeah. simple emails <laughs> that they don't have to hack into cars. Um, you know, and so... We have the opportunity to be able to define the future before these types of things occur. But and, and maybe this is the platform for the Milken Institute to really begin. To, and I love your point earlier, which is how can we create a world in which criminals who think that they can come from one IP address are completely absolved from actually, you know, um, from any sort of penalty? I mean, we, we actually interviewed a ton of ransomware developers because. Like I said, they've got a help desk. And we, we, we asked them and we said, why do you do ransomware? Why have you chose cybercrime? And like overwhelmingly, actually one in three didn't even respond, but the, mo the rest of them were happy to talk to us. And they said, because I'm not going to get caught. They genuinely feel that this is a crime in which there is no penalty. There is zero risk for them. And so you've crea we've got this emerging cr criminal area in which there's a perception that I'm not going to get found out. And unfortunately, mm. by and large, they're right. Yeah. Mm. Another question. question. If someone who's been waiting. Um, is that microphone there? In, in the back there, yes. Hi, uh, yeah. Is there a place for um, hush mail and proton mail in business um, using encrypted email systems? Um, I tend to find if we use an encrypted email system, the clients at the other end don't want to use it or they want to go back to their Outlook or their whatever. So, however much we try and be encrypted, as soon as you get to the other end, they want to decrypt, they want to use their normal system. Just the panel's views on encrypted emails, the hush mail, proton mail. I've been involved with encrypted email for a number of years. Um, I used to work with PGP um, encrypted email a long time ago. Um, the enemy of PGP was always thought to be complexity, um, in that you had to do a whole lot of key management, age out keys, and make sure you looked after your own key. And you had to do key distribution, because someone had to have your key before they could send you an encrypted mail. So nobody used it and it was a, a, big, a big pain. Um, and then a bit later on in my career, I got involved with something called identity-based encryption, which was still public-private key pair encryption, but the public key was actually your email address. So you didn't have to worry about anyone having signed up ahead of time. You could just send an encrypted email to anybody using their email address as their public key. And I thought, wow, well, that fixes the problem. Everyone's going to start using this. Nobody started using it. Um, to the point where I'm not even sure if it exists anymore. Uh, obviously, as a concept, it exists, but as a product, I have no idea. Um, people just can't be bothered. While we're still willing to send postcards, we're still willing to send encrypted email. And it's like complexity, um, uh, convenience trumps security all the time, and complexity is the enemy of convenience. Um, we, we still trust paper envelopes, and we still trust postcards with no envelopes, and we don't view our digital communications any differently whatsoever. Is there a place for it? Sure. Are people going to use it? Not really. In any way, it has a limited lifetime. Key-based, public-private key-based encryption as a technology dies when quantum becomes a reality because it breaks the, the factoring of prime numbers. Yeah, but not always. I, I think you do have an opportunity. You know, if you have a clear policy and you're transferring data, which is highly sensitive, you know, I used to work as a CISO, and we actually made it a mandatory, mandatory requirement for all of our third-party suppliers to adhere to specific <laughs> security requirements. And, and you know, if, if you have suppliers of your own, you can actually mandate and make that a requirement, but you have to get it right in the contract stage, because once you've signed the contracts and you want to introduce anything after that, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Money. And, Money. <laughs> and decide whether you want... Good luck. <laughs> but if you, to, to yeah, Marianne's right. expertise, and, and she should probably lead on this, if you have any disclosure requirements or you want to catch insider trading or any of those things, then if you've outsourced to a perfectly secure environment, you might find yourself open to a load of new problems if you're trying to do business in New York or with the financial services or something like that. So uh, unfortunately, there isn't a black and white technical silver bullet, but I imagine you can add a lot yeah, to that. Well, there's a whole lot of considerations the moment you're actually transferring data across borders and, and all the... Uh, um, 
legalities of that surround that, which comes back to being prepared for the realities. I mean, I started there of what does it mean to keep a data secure? What does it mean you, when you actually get hacked? What does it mean to keep the organization going? I'm conscious there was one more hand up, but it didn't get to. You've got t 12 seconds. Yeah. 12 seconds. <laughs> I just wanted to, to add something. In my country, we have cyber gyms, which are mandatory for the public sector to be trained. So the level of, especially in infrastructure, critical infrastructure, transportation, electricity, etc., and that helps a lot in lowering the risk of the public sector. And in the private sector, one of the things that we do with ransomware, we trace back the guys that do the ransom, and basically we tell them, we know who you are, we know your photo, we know your address, and terrible things are going to happen to you. And basically, it's, I call it the barking dog. You have a barking dog with terrible teeth, and the thief just goes to your neighbor, probably to London. I don't know where, but uh, it has been extremely effective, and I have to tell you that we have seen on statistics that the number of attacks went down dramatically. And I think this is good for any attack, because in the end of the attack, there is a person. And if you trace him and he thinks that he's punishable, whether it's real or not real, he normally don't deal with you, unless you have a fantastic motivation. And on that hopeful note, we will bring it to a close. Thank you very much. It's Thank been you. a great time. Thank you. Thank you.